welcome to the Real Estate Investing Made Simple Club. And we do live interviews with experts and leaders in the real estate investing world. So thanks for being here today. I see a few more are joining us. I'm Leanne Riley, and I'm a real estate coach nationally and a broker. And I help ambitious people build a step-by-step -step roadmap to a six-figure income by creating a real estate portfolio of winning cash flow properties. I built a $14 million portfolio in residential, multifamily, condo development, commercial, and vacation properties. And today, I lead the Encore Investment Team of Realtors in the Twin Cities, Minnesota, and I have my Proven Profit Formula coaching program. So check out my YouTube channel too. Lots of free education over there. It's called Leanne Riley Real Estate. And be sure, sure and subscribe when you're over there. Today's topic is going to be really fun. It is secrets for investors and a market update. And we're in a volatile time. So this is going to be good. We're, we're not going to kill you with data, but we're going to show you the important stuff. And today I want to introduce Eric Jansen. And he is my chief operating officer in the Digital Marketing Proven Profit Formula Coaching Program. And he is a realtor on the Encore Investment Team that I lead. And guess what? He's a data geek too. So he is going to start us out today. I'm really glad you could join us. I see we have more people coming on. And he's going to start us out today. Really glad to see you, Eric. And I'm glad you are a data geek. And he's going to show us some of these important things about inflation and the rates and all the realities of today. So take it on, Eric. Sure. So um, I'll just share the screen here. I got a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, the first few slides are going to be about the economy. And then the next few are about the market. And then we're going to get into some secrets after that. So without further ado, I will see if I can get this all to work. So, got that. Okay. okay, here we go. And there we go. All right, you should be able to see the slides, the secrets. Is that, see that, Leanne? Yep, I can see everything fine. All right, perfect. So, like, like I said, we're going to go through market updates with some data and some charts. We're not going to try to overwhelm you, but we want to make sure you guys get the idea of what's going on, uh, where the market's going, and then we'll go through some secrets, eight secrets for smart investors after that. So first graph we have here is inflation. So inflation is kind of the big, you know, talking point these days, obviously. Uh, it's gone up quite a bit, you know, since COVID and, uh, you know, things have been uh, changing in the market, not only the housing market, but just in general in the economy because of inflation. So on this graph, what I wanna show you here is where the circle is here uh, on the graph. And uh, it, it shows where it peaked. Now we peaked in June of this last year at 9.1%. And basically what that means, it's what they do with inflation is it's a consumer price index. They take all that stuff at the top you see there, they take all those items and they, they kind of average them, they put them all together in a big bucket, and then they figure out what, what the percentage is or what, how much prices as an average among those things have gone up from one month of a year to the month before in that year. So example, like for February of this year versus February of last year, how much have those prices gone up or down uh, during that time? And that percentage then is the consumer price index. So uh, 9.1 is what we capped out at in uh, June uh, of last year. And now over the last seven months, it's come down steadily. And now we're sitting at about 6.4%. So again, 6.4% prices were up from February of last year to February of this year. March numbers obviously, or um, next, yeah, actually that's January, sorry, January numbers. February numbers aren't out until next week, the 14th on Tuesday. So the goal of the Fed right now, why they're raising all these rates is they want to get us down to 2%, 2%, if you can see my cursor here, it's right about in there is 2%. So we got a little ways to go yet. So we'll see some more hikes as we go on. So we'll get into that. 
The good news is it's going down. Correct. The good news is going down. Hopefully it remains that way and uh, we can continue that trend going through the rest of 2023. Here's big reason why it's been going down. So the Fed has been hiking rates and this is a federal fund rates. This is not mortgage rates. Some people get confused and think the Fed is raising rates, therefore mortgage rates are going up. That's not exactly right. The Fed rate is different than the mortgage rate, but they do kind of run kind of similar trends. So the Fed rates have been going up as the Fed Reserve has been hiking those rates to tame inflation and mortgage rates have kind of come up at the same time, but they don't, they don't run parallel. So the Fed rate could go up one time and the mortgage rate could go down at the set on the same day. It just, uh, they're not exactly the same. But the Fed has been over the last year raising rates, quarter point, half point, three quarter point, half point, three quarter point. Good news here is the last two times they've raised the rates, they've actually decreased the, the amount that they've raised. They've only raised a half and then they raised a quarter. Okay, that's the bottom of the chart, right? Me. That's the top of the chart. Oh, the top. Okay, fifth. Okay, yep. got it. Yep, we're working at from the bottom to the top. Yeah, so the okay. top is the most recent. So, um, so yeah, right here in the top. So, yeah, the projection was, is the thought was among experts is that over the next two Fed meetings, they were going to raise it by a quarter point each, and then they were going to hold there for a while and see, see what that did to the economy, what that did to inflation. Uh, jo Jerome Powell, the chair of the Fed, met with Congress just a few days ago and gave indications that that's not what they're planning on doing now. They've got indicators out there that Inflation is not where they want it to be, and they're planning now a half a point increase in the next meeting, which is set for March 21st, 22nd. 22nd is when they'll announce the increase. So good news is, is it's, it's starting to slow down as far as the rate. Bad news is it's not quite where they want it, so there's going to be some continued hikes moving forward. Right, and remember, that's the that rate is not the mortgage rate. Just Cor that's the correct. Fed. We're going to tell you about that in a minute. Yep. Yep. Last slide here on the economy as a whole. So here's the unemployment rate. So we're at 3.4% unemployment. That was as of um, the January numbers. And uh, if you look at the chart here, 3.4%, it's a, you know, it's a historic low level. If you look over the last 20 years, it's pretty much looks like the bottom. And uh, so that's good news, right? Well, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a confusing thing that some people say is, well, the job report came in good. Why are we, why did the stock market go down? Because you'll see that if the job report comes out on Friday and it shows 3.4 or 3.3 or the, you know, the economy's looking stronger, you'll see the stock market go down, which doesn't make sense, right? But the reason why is because when this unemployment rate stays low, the Fed needs to then continue to raise rates or raise, raise the federal fund rate because what they're trying to do is they're trying to add to the unemployment. They wanna get it to about four and a half percent. And the reason for that is because if unemployment comes or goes up, if there's more people unemployed, there'll be less money in the economy, which in turn will then have uh, less inflation, you know, in theory, less inflation because there'll be less money going out and there'll be, um, you know, more people, less people buying things, prices then could start to come down some. So it's kind of backwards of what we're normally thinking. Unemployment low, low rates are good. In this case, they're actually not. So now, just so you know, we're going to get a new report in two days. But Correct. This is what we have today. Yep, this is what we have today. So in two days, we'll get a report. Um, not sure exactly what we'll be thinking of what that report will be. And, you know, I'm assuming it's going to be close to the same amount, but you know, we'll see in two days. Um, these shaded areas that you can see here, if you can see my cursor there, there's a shaded area here and a shaded area here. Those are indications of a, a recession. So this was the 08 recession. And then we had a, a you know, quick recession from COVID where unemployment spiked, everything went out of whack, everything closed down. And then that came back you know, fairly quickly. So those are what those shaded areas are, if you were wondering. Now we get into some uh, data when it comes to the housing market. So this graph is showing the mortgage rates. The mortgage rates, again, like I said, they don't, they don't run the same as the actual uh, rates when it comes to the Fed rates. But right now we're around 7%. So if you look here, we're at 7% mortgage rates. Uh, it did take a dip in uh, late January, early February. We were down around 6% right here. And that actually 
gave a lot of people some optimism that we were seeing the top was here, we were coming down, everything was you know good, and then we kind of spiked back up. And that was just because inflation isn't going down quick enough. And that, you know, and this is tied to the 10-year treasury and things like that. It's not tied to the Fed rate, but um the inflation is still not under control. So this is still kind of out of whack a little bit. So um historically though, so if I can let me just try to do something here. I'm gonna see if I can click out of here. Do you see that? Yep. Okay, so this is the interactive um live shot of the graph. And so if you go back and look back, let's say five years, you can see where we were really low here at you know end of 21, you know, getting into 22, how we were, you know, below three percent, and then how it came up considerably over the last you know year or so. But if you look out over uh, you know, the max, basically going back to 71 when they started this, uh, when they started charting this, you can see back here in the 80s, we had rates up into the 18, 19, or 18 and a half percent here in October of 81. So it's, it's, it's far greater than what we're looking at today. And back then, you know, people were able to find property. People were able I gotta to I got to tell investments. you, the very first so. rehab I ever did was in the 80s back there. And it was time to cash out refi and the rate was 18%. But you know what? I think I walked away with a check for $125,000 on that rehab. And I was paying the 18%, but it didn't matter. I kept the building, you guys. It was a triplex because I still cash flowed. So it it's really about the formula. Yep, yep, for sure. And so there's deals to be had, even though we're, you know, 7% or whatever, there's deals to be had. And you know, I kind of questioned this a little bit with Leanne, you know, a week or so ago, I said, well, yeah, but, you know, we got bad inflation and stuff going on right now. Well, guess what was going on back then? Inflation as well. So it's really about finding the right property and finding the right, right deals. So let me see if I can go back to the slideshow now. Um, there is a slideshow on? Yep. All right, that worked. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide, which is Median sales prices. So this is Redfin's data, uh, and this is actually hot off the press. I just uh, put this slide on here few, about an hour ago. It's it's brand new, so it's it's their new data. And what this is showing is this is showing median sales prices in metro areas, um, you know, across the United States. So the orange line here, this is 2021. This is the sales prices in 2021 and the trend of those. So you see, you know, you kind of have this up and then kind of leveling off or down kind of every year. And that's typically, you know, you go through your summer, spring, summer, and then fall, winter. So that kind of does tend to happen. Um, it was more prevalent last year because that was when you had the start of the rate hikes really were really prevalent there. But you see 2022 is this darker line here. And then as 2023 comes in, you can see right here on a nation, nationwide basis, it's, it's running very parallel to 2022. Um, maybe a slightly below, I think it's 1% below right here, but it's running very parallel to, to that uh, as well as 2022. So that's encouraging sign that, you know, we're not seeing this big crash or any kind of, you know, issues. And we'll get into why, why you know, I don't feel there's a crash here in the next slide, but basically that's uh, a nationwide look. So I'm going to click on here and I want to show you some difference as far as regions go uh, from this graph, because I think it's quite interesting to look at uh, when you look at a nationwide picture, we're 1% below year over year. But if you look at, uh, let's look at uh, Los Angeles as an example, you go out west and things are not as pretty. And so this blue line here, this is 2023, remember it's below 2022 already. So it's already trending below 2022. It's running similar or parallel to it, but it's parallel to it at a negative 6%, negative 4%. So it's already below. So trending, it looks like, you know, maybe already below the rest of the year, but we'll see how it goes. But uh, LA and California out West, they're not doing so well with the rate, rate hikes. So that'd be a tricky area to be buying in right now when they're trending below what people paid a year ago. Is that what we're saying? Well, buying may be okay because you can buy for cheaper. Um, yeah. But if you're selling, it's just, it's, it's, yeah, it, they can get them for a little bit cheaper, but where is the market going to go? Is it going to go even cheaper there? 
you know, you yeah. don't really know, but yeah, it's, it's, but prices have come down, I guess, is the bottom line. In Minneapolis, St. Paul here area here, um, we've been trending a little above. Now we're kind of even with it. So we're kind of like the national average, maybe a little above um, the national average. So we're doing a little bit better. The Midwest and the South is doing better than, than West. Um, yes, you know, that's so. what, if, if anybody's buying all over the US, like short-term rentals or whatever, the Midwest and the South is where you should be buying. Now it's, it's holding, it's, it's more uh, predictable. Yeah, and the Midwest in general does much better when it, and it comes to downtimes with recessions and stuff like that. We don't, we're not as volatile as some markets like Phoenix is pretty volatile or volatile where it goes up and down in drastic swings. We stay pretty steady here. Uh, maybe, but that's the, maybe that's the Minnesota nice thing. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I want to also show you as Miami. Miami is actually doing very well uh, in, in so far this year. They're trending uh, quite a bit above they're at seven, eight uh, percent up above. And if you look at their peak last year, their peak was 489 from an average sales price. They're at 41. They're not no. far off of their peak from last year. So they're they're trending really, really well in Miami to where, you know, it is looks like it's dipping a little bit. But so far, it looks pretty good overall for Miami um, for 2023. So it just depends on where you are in the market in the United States as far as what's going on. One of the things we want to tell you too, go ahead and switch it back, is um, the suburbs are doing better than the full city. And anybody who's from Minnesota, we can see that in downtown is in a whole different place. I just read the other day, you know, 20 caribous are closing or, you know, it, it's really the, you know, remote working has affected things. But suburbs are doing better from than the city, and we're going to tell you why here later. Yep, yep, for sure. Okay, so enough on that slide, but that's some information. And this is the last slide we're going to go over when it comes to the uh, housing or the you know, housing market. And this, unfortunately, a little older data. It's it's just a month old, but it's not. It's it's pretty similar numbers today. Um, I would assume nothing has changed drastically. Uh, but we're looking at January numbers here. And what this is, is this is just Minnesota as a whole, January numbers. And what this is showing is low inventory levels. Now, inventory, if you look over here, inventory is 40% up, actually. Wait, so, where are we looking? Down at the bottom. Okay. Yeah, can you see my cursor chart. down here? Yep. Okay, so a year ago in 2022 is a light blue. We were at one month of inventory. And basically, that means that no more houses went on the market and everything were to just to sell that's on the market, it would take about a month to go through. Um, now we're at 1.4 months. So it's, it's gone up 40%, which seems like a big number, but when you're going from one to 1 1.4, you know, a, a, a basically an even market, a stable market where it's even among buyers and sellers is about six months worth of inventory. So again, we've been really low, historically low um, for a number of years now. And, uh, but this draw, this increase in inventory, people are like, oh, okay, yeah, inventory is going up, supply is going up. So that's good. The problem is, is that it's not going up in new listings. So if you look at new listings from 2022 to 2023, the listings are actually down a little bit, um, 4,800 to 4,200, 4, 4,300, down 12%. The reason this inventory is, is up is because days on market is actually a little bit more. So we were at 43 days on market in 2022 and 52 in 2023. So that's a 21% increase. So, I got a question. Yep. Do you think, you know, the fact, this is the fact here in Minnesota, we had maybe two, maybe three blizzards during January. Could that throw the market, you know, 12 days different? It, I don't know about that many days different, but it probably does have an effect. Winter, harsher winters, I'm sure have a, a more of an effect yeah. because, you know, I know I have, I have buyers who we, we had one buyer who wanted to look at a house and waited till after the snowstorm just recently and it was gone by then. So somebody that was willing to, to brave the snow and go out and take a look at the property was able to go out and put an offer and get it accepted. So um, yeah, that probably could have an effect if it's cold or if it's snowing, people don't wanna go out and it could, nope. cause, could cause properties to sit a little bit longer. But we're also looking at January of last year, January of this year. I don't remember what the weather was like in January of last year, but winter is kind of winter sometimes. So it's, you know, it's as close as we can get to a comparison. 
a general rule is, is that it, properties are sitting a little longer right now. So we'll see how that work trends out. Maybe that's just like, like Leanne saying, maybe that's just this year. Winter's a little bit worse this year and that trend will go away and things will even out because that could also affect new listings. You know, you got a worse winter and people just oh, I'll wait until the spring, you know, so so that's that's the data there. And um, again, you know, the reason inventory is so low, I wanted to kind of go back on this. And this is this is a big reason why, in my opinion, I don't see that there's going to be like a huge market crash, at least not in our market, is that, you know, housing units are way down from what they what they need to be. We're five million houses short from where we need to be um, because of what happened in the 08 crash. Builders just haven't kept up with building over the last at least 10 years and it's causing uh, a, a major issue with housing and that you know not just single family homes but just housing in general apartments all that you're you know there's kind of a surge in apartment building right now because there's not enough housing in general for people so um and then the other thing i want to note on this is new build starts so you know construction crews are going to start building new properties over the last five months in a row now those have come down so new builds have come down as, as mortgage rates are higher, there's there's less buyer demand. So builders are less, you know, wanting to go out and build a home. If there's nobody to buy it, why would they want to build it? So um, it was down four and a half percent from December to January was the last data point that I had, but it's been down five months in a row through January. So, okay. Can you go flip off the slides yep. for a moment? And I just want to check in with our guests here. Yep. We got some questions. Sure. That's all the big data stuff. And I know it's a lot to take on, but um, Renee is saying, oh, <laughs> yep. we were talking about winter and the storms and she's saying that's the best time to look when no one else wants to look snowstorms, holidays, et cetera. And um, I know why she's saying this because this is perfect. We snagged a deal. I remember a fourplex on Thanksgiving weekend because we went out there and we snagged it before anybody could. Thanks, Renee. Yep. Anybody else have a question just on data or anything about mortgage? You can go ahead, put it in the chat box and because we're going to move on to something here, not so much the data. I know it's overwhelming that data. Uh, and, you know, Eric always says, you know, we don't have a magic wand. We don't have a crystal ball. This is kind of some bleak news. And we dug deep to get the most current data we could anywhere. And it, yeah, it's, it's bleak. Yeah, it's really going to, it's really going to hinge on inflation. Will inflation keep coming down? Like I said, the good news is, is seven straight months, that number has come down. You know, if that continues trending that direction, the, the Fed will continue to ease up. Mortgage rates will continue to ease up. Things will continue to improve. It's really going to hinge on that. We'll see more data next week on that. Um, again, like we don't have a crystal ball. I'm not going to sit and say everything's going to be great because I don't, I don't know where things are going to go. But, um, you know, the market, there's always deals out there. There's always opportunities out there. It's always good for somebody. You just got to figure out which way to go with that and what, what to do with the information. Now that you have it, what do you do with it to make it work for you? Is kind of how I look at it. Okay, we got a couple more questions. Can you discuss the trend of the inventory? You mean the lack of inventory? What he did say was about, you know, they, did, they haven't built enough. The, hey, babies keep being born and, you know, all of, you know, the population continues to rise. And building hasn't kept up since even before 2008. And, you know, we're a long ways from that. And it just can't, you know, and then COVID slowed it all down with the supply chain issues. It is going to take a long time before we get a balanced market. Like he said, the six months of inventory available. And that's what's different when you look back in history. The shortage has not been this big, but there's no quick solution to solve it. You can't suddenly build a gazillion. One of the trends we're seeing is, you, and I bet if you drive around whatever city you live in, multifamily, there, there's a lot of buildings popping up. Yep. And that is one reason why they're doing that right now is, you know, they can build a lot at once and kind of solve the 
more units, um, but you're seeing, I see some of the national syndicators, they have moved, if you look, they've shifted into single family rental houses. They're like building them more kind of like row houses. They're not connected. They're not multifamily, but sort of the combo between the townhouse and the single family house. They're using less land, building them a little cheaper. And it's just a very good trend because renting's not going away. It's a good solution for quicker inventory. Yep. And I'll answer the second question she has. January is up 40% from last January. What about months leading up to January? It's been consistently up over the last, I would say, four or five months. Um, I don't, I'm not going to say 40%. I don't have the data in front of me, but I know it's gone up um, over that course of time. So, and it's really, all the numbers have been really fairly consistent over the last six, five, six months, probably. Uh, new listings are down. Uh, days on market is up and inventory overall is up. And those numbers have stayed consistent. The percentages have, have changed a little bit, but that trend has stayed consistent through the last half of the year and into this year. And so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we're seeing is this houses are sitting in the market longer. Now you go back six months in Minnesota, what do you have? You have winter the whole time. So once we get into the spring market, mar spring market's really gonna, a lot of it's gonna depend on what happens with inflation, then in turn, what happens with mortgage rates, and then that'll determine how excited people are, in, you know, to go into the market, both buyers and sellers. So, and you know, like I said, this is the most recent data, right into an hour before the presentation. That one chart moved. Yep. So um, we did the best we could. Now I see Renee is answering in the Q and A section. Just so I don't know if the chat box is working. Somebody try it, but otherwise go to the Q&A and you can put your question right there. It's at the bottom of your screen. We want to address your questions as we're going along. So anybody else got a question? Otherwise, we're going to move on to our investor secrets, given this is what we have to work with. You know, we, we can't control the market. This is the way it is. Now, a smart investor is someone who can say, okay, this is the deck of cards. Now, how do we make money in this climate? Because there is always a way. And when you're a savvy real estate investor, you learn to pivot. And that's what we're talking about next is what are our, what do we see? And we see a different side because we work with a lot of investors and we're realtors, we're out there in the market, we kind of see it before you folks do, because we're out there over the weekend and all of a sudden there's multiple offers and, you know, it just hit the market and we're like, huh? So we're, we, we're going to report on that, what we're seeing live. Looks like no more questions, Eric. So go on to the next part here. Okay. See the slides again? Yep. I see the low inventory. Okay, the, uh, there we go. So, oh, this yep. is your inner, your- Okay, your I just wanna <laughs> say, you know, if you're an investor and you need help either to buy, sell or invest here in the Twin Cities market, we go from St. Cloud to Rochester and anywhere in between, or if you might be trying to get into investing or need some help, you're already there, but not sure what to do. I have my proven profit formula coaching program and you can always get a free strategy session to chat about, would it be a good fit? And the easiest way is go over to the website and there's lots of places to push the button to schedule. All right, here we go. Secret number one. And this, this is what we see out in the market. There's the, there's three ways to make money in real estate that, don't change much. A, if you have a cash flowing property. Now, there's two ways to do that. It could be when you buy it, it already cash flows. That's getting tighter now. Used to be able to do it last year and the year before, but it's getting tighter. Or if you add some sort of value, we'll talk a little more about that. How to, how to get that cash flow up there. Never forget, there's tax advantages when you buy real estate. 
And there's also the potential of appreciation. So if you can figure out how to buy winning cash flow properties, that's exactly what I teach in my program, and get that tax advantage, use your money wisely. So you got that and buy in an appreciating area. And there's a lot of little clues, but you got to know what they are. You get all those three together and then that's what makes a good deal. All right. Secret number two is the secret to finding cash flow is in the value add. And I want to say that's really true. See the handyman picture over there? If you can find something, well, the easy way is let's say you have a starter home, three bedroom, one bath in a first tier or second tier suburb of whatever city you're in. And those are usually the least expensive, okay? Now you buy that home and maybe you can put a bedroom and a bath in the basement with an egress window. If you happen to be in the Midwest, we have basements. If you, maybe you can, I love the second picture. See that second picture? That is called a clothus. And what that is, that's just a closet with a bifold door. They took the bifold door off. They put in that desk there, some shelves. That is a clothus. Now that is a way to add value. And some tenant who's working at home they are going to pick that over the next one, even if that's $100, $150, $200 more, because their home office is set up. And what did that cost you as the owner of the building? Well, you got to get rid of those ugly bifolds. And, you know, a couple of pieces of plywood practically can make that shelf or some countertop. It's pretty inexpensive, really, to turn a, a closet into a clothus. I've seen it a lot of times when you go down the stairs, a lot of times there's maybe a double little closet right there. I've seen it there when you're going down into that lower level, lots of places. So little things like that, um, I'm gonna give you a couple more ways to add cash flow. So and the reason value. they'd wanna put that in is because of? The reason we want a clothus? Yeah. People Remote work. workers. There you go. Yep. You know, they're, everybody's working at home, let's face it. I mean, or at least a couple days a week. It's, it's just critical. Even the kids could use that as their study area. It's just such a popular thing. So a small office space so you can get away from the rest of the family. Another really big secret for being a landlord is to add a dishwasher. It sounds crazy in that little house you just bought or a townhouse or anything. If you're going to have tenants, you get a different clientele that won't rent anything if there's not a dishwasher. Then though, you can basically a dishwasher adds $100 a month to your rent. It's ju It just does. People want dishwashers. And maybe you got to reconfigure the kitchen or lose a cabinet next to the sink to put it in, but it's worth it. Not the kind you roll over there, though. That'll eat your water bill. An installed dishwasher. Or do some sort of a light rehab. I'm not talking at a bedroom and a bathroom. I am just talking light rehab in the sense of making it more welcoming. It might be flooring. It might be cleaning. <clears throat> it could be painting that basement floor, even if you're not going to finish the floor and putting paint on that ugly wood paneling down there, that is not expensive. But then suddenly a person can use the space. So it's what I'm saying here, you can find cash flow, maybe not the day you close on it, but if you have a value add plan, you might have to get your cash flow that way in this market. Okay, or you might have to, Eric, the other scenario we were talking about you might have to know that, okay, this first year, I might not get that cash flow until I can get that tenant out and raise the rent or like that if you bought it with somebody already in mm -hmm. it. Yep. Yep. And there's a, you know, not a little off of this topic a little bit, but, you know, there's the idea of buying it now, little cash flow, and then maybe eventually in a couple of years being able to refinance and get that cash flow. Just got to make sure you understand that if you didn't put a lot of money into it, 
and it doesn't appraise for as much, they might not approve it. So as long as you're you know, buying it as an investment, you're not buying it with three or 5% down, you're buying it with 20, 25% down, should be okay to be able to do that. But that is another potential option. This is a better one because you can get your cash flow right away out of the property and you're not you know, hoping and wishing for something down the line a little bit more. That's why so. I love the Clawfus. It's not that expensive, but it's super attractive in today's economy. That's the kind of clever thinking you have to have. And one place to look for that stuff is get over to Pinterest and start seeing what the trends are, or it might give you very inexpensive value add ideas. Yep. All right. Moving okay. On to what's secret number three? All right. This is about the uh, rental market being strong. It's really, really strong. There's not enough housing. This same inventory problem is affecting people trying to rent. They can't find anywhere either, okay? It's the lowest national vacancy rate in over 40 years. Like, think about that. That's low. And it's the national vacancy rate is 6%. <clears throat> And in the Twin Cities right now, this was the latest stats we could find, 3.9%. <clears throat> I got a cough, Eric. You take it for a minute. Okay. So, yeah, like I had mentioned before, the reason for that is because of a lack of housing units. And, um, you know, as population has grown <laughs> over the years, the building of not only single family, but multifamily, you know, whether it's two to four unit or if it's a, a larger multifamily has not kept up with the overall population growth. So, and on top of that, with the rates being hiked, with, with um, uh, property value still being high, there is a issue as far as affordability goes for somebody going to buy a home. So what's happening is instead of buying it, people are saying, I can't afford to buy, it's too expensive to buy, therefore I have to rent. And so that's driving this up. I don't know if you're, you're better now, but... <laughs> Okay, flip the slideshow off for a minute so I can. Sure. I just want to see if anybody has any questions. I got a little, few more little tips to say right here about this. Um, one of the other trends that you've got to understand is out there is baby boomers are the biggest portion of renters. Okay, baby boomers. Now think about that. What does an older resident, because that's not a young millennial, what do they need? as a different accommodation in this rental property. They might, uh, and there's also multi-generational, maybe they're moving in, you know, with the kids and they're renting together or something like that. I've seen that a lot. So this is where I, like one of the examples, I love split levels for this, for, for to own as a rental, a split level is cool because you can take that lower level sometimes and make a mini apartment sort of down there, especially if you put in just a, a mini kitchen. You know, you can even sometimes use the laundry sink for the dishes. I mean, I've seen it done, but you can plumb off of that laundry sink sometime right into the next room. And uh, you can, you know, nowadays, all you need is an Instapot, an air fryer down there that handles the stove, um, maybe a hot plate then you can have a mini fridge. You can, you know, outfit a second party in the house pretty easily in a lower level like that. And a lot of times roommates love that too. Or if you're going to house hack, that fits. You can live upstairs and pretty much have run of the place and you can have a roommate down there and charge a lot more rent and maybe even a separate entrance. It's really a good floor plan for um, renting. And now, now let's put the baby boomer hat on. Uh oh, they might not like steps. So there's a reason why maybe your strategy is just one level townhomes. What's great about that is you'll get some sort of a senior tenant who will stay forever, you know, till they can't anymore. <laughs> So start to think about what do the baby boomers want? And that's another little niche that will can make you some good money and is a good appreciation play. 
because there's we're not going to run out of seniors there become there's more now than there ever was yeah more and more retiring yeah yep yep okay back to the slides Go back to the slide secret number four oops One second there we go there it is okay yep. this one we this touched is, on this a little bit already yeah but i'm gonna talk about the suburbs the suburbs hold their value because this is where the majority of families might live and they might choose a certain suburb because of a school district. Okay. Um, that's why I moved to a certain suburb because I had a special needs child. And that to me was more important than anything was what school district am I moving into? Um, and the other thing about these higher interest rates and higher prices to buy, there's going to be more families who are actually forced to rent. It's the affordability issue. They can't afford the housing, so they have to rent, but they don't want to live in an apartment. They want a single family house. Remote workers are tending to go further away. Maybe they have to drive to work one or two days a week, which is a lot different than five days a week. And so they're willing to live out further. It's cheaper, actually. Even to rent, it's cheaper the further you go. And here's a stat. 68% of the people live in suburban or rural areas. And that number has increased over the last five years. That's a lot of the renters, 68%, over half. And what do they look for is a safe and quiet family friendly neighborhood. They want indoor and outdoor space that allows them to grow for their children. Maybe they got pets. You got to look at that one. You know, pets are a hundred bucks a month. You know, pets can be a good addition to get the cash, cash flow, but you better have some rules. Maybe they have pets or they want to move in that multi-generational other family members are getting together. You'll see more of that now too. Two sisters renting together or whatever. And you need a child-friendly home with the AC, a washer and a dryer and a dishwasher, the amenities that a family might want. Maybe there's four kids, you need a dishwasher. Unless one of the kids will do it. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, okay. moving on to secret number five. Okay, this one, here's the thing about buying real estate. Purchasing a home is wealth building over the long haul. And just know that real estate isn't a short game. It's And it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's a long haul play. And whether you're an investor, or you're buying your own personal residence, wealth is created through real estate over time. Yep, and I have an example of that when I bought my house. Um, I bought kind of, at, it was around the peak of the you know crash there and the recession. And I watched as I bought my house, the value of my home go down and I didn't put a lot of money down on it. And I watched it go down, 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 down to where I had a fair amount of uh, negative equity in my home but I was planning on staying there for the long haul. And, you know, I would say it, it bottomed out around 200,000 in value. And uh, now it's up over four, four and a quarter, somewhere in that range uh, as far as value today. So, you know, it, it's just, if you keep it long enough, you pay it down, pay down the loan, you know, you're eventually going to see that equity. I didn't see it at first, but I didn't panic because I knew I wasn't going to move anytime soon. I just knew I, I couldn't move at that point. So that was the, that was a downside, but I hung on to it long enough and now I'm okay. Well, and you know what? That's the thing. Anybody who bought a house in the last, you know, prior to five years ago and even in, in, in the low, it has appreciated. And, you know, I don't like to count that because that's paper money. It's not mm -hmm. real until you sure. either sell your house or do something. Yep, that's true. What I love about rental property is, even if we use Eric's house as the example, as long as you're not selling it in the low and that tenant is paying that rent, you're getting your obligation is less and less and less. So just hang on through the low. And then if you are thinking of selling it, really time that right. 
Yep. And that's pretty much secret six here too, is, is if in a strategy to buy and hold is to keep the property long-term and not panic on what's happening right now in the market. Right. And, you know, hopefully if you did buy something and you had it in the, you know, you refined it at the 2.5 and the 3%. I just talked to a lady who has 86 units and she wouldn't want to sell because she refined them during that low period. Now we don't have that anymore. It's 7% right now. It's still lower than 18%, but 7%, we have to learn to work with it. And like, this is why I love cash flow. If you got a tenant in there, and as long as even if it's only a hundred bucks a month, they're paying your mortgage down. Let's see. So like Eric said, don't get panicky about what's going on today. If you're on the buy and hold long-term play, mm -hmm. wait till the market is right. And then that's when you would get rid of it if you wanted to. Or so many people, some people, they just, I was talking to an investor the other day too. And he's like, I want whatever I can hang on to for the next 15 years. That's what I want. What, do, what, what should I get? Yep. All right. Ready for the next one? Yep. Secret, Secret seven. Number seven. We got eight of them for you. This is interesting. I, anybody who's trying to grow a portfolio there's some volatility going on right now in the multifamily, the larger multifamily. Anybody who has a commercial loan, say they bought that in the last three to five years. Commercial loans have five-year rates on them. It's pretty much it's it's a 30-year mortgage, but it's a five-year rate adjustment. Maybe it's a 25-year mortgage. In 25, yeah. Yeah. But they're a lot of those three to five years ago, they're coming due right now. And guess what? That darn rate is higher and it's a problem. If if operators are not well capitalized, they're going to actually lose their buildings or they're going to have to sell them right now. They're going to have to because they can't keep them afloat and they can't get a new loan. I never understood this until I owned a lot of multifamily and I saw this same thing happen um, in like 2010. It, it happened more than once because that's a five-year game and you really have to be watching that. And sometimes people, they just aren't capitalized enough to hold that bigger multifamily. And this could be happening to someone with even a five unit, just so you know, because that's commercial financing, five and up, but you're going to see it in the big stuff if you really look around. So they got the higher rates and their rates are worse than 7%, just so you know, higher down payments, the numbers are harder to get working. There's You're going to see a lot of opportunity there though. All right, and the last one. Secret number eight. What we're seeing out here as realtors is obviously cash. Cash is always king. Anybody who can buy with cash, you, you have a lot of creativity in that. You don't have to be concerned with the rates if you got cash. And you know what? There's a lot of people with cash. And I just want to mention the hedge fund funds have a lot of cash right now. And if anybody's been around for a while back back in 08 09 010 they were buying like some of the hedge funds came into different towns and they would buy 400 500 houses single family houses and now if you look down the pike they've got even more money and they are starting to go in and buy triple that many houses fast so they have to park that money somewhere and it's a safe place to park it in single family houses. So uh, cash, of course, is king. Now, what we're seeing is creative financing right now, something called subject to, because it's a lower interest rate. It's a little complex. A lot of realtors don't even understand it. You're seeing contracts for deed. That's what we call them here in Minnesota. Some other states call them land trusts. But that is where the seller is going to 
hold the financing and you're actually paying the seller, they are your mortgage company, but you can negotiate a better rate. And boy, in the last three, four years, you weren't seeing much of it, but in the last six to eight months, I see a lot of it now. It's a way someone can unload the property and still uh, they can move on and you can get a good deal. So you can negotiate that at a better rate. I just closed a deal and it was a better rate than the bank on that CD. And you're going to see, oh, another thing that's available that we just maybe didn't notice for a while. There, there is more and more assumable mortgages on FHA and VA loans. Now, I saw a great deal with a VA assumable, and I think they wanted less than 10000 down. But the problem on that is you also had to be eligible for a VA. You had to be a vet, too, to buy that property. But FHA, you don't. If someone is selling a property, they have an FHA assumable loan, and there was a lot of them written, you can keep that piece of paper and pay their mortgage at 3% or whatever, and then maybe take a new loan for a smaller cap. It's all about putting the deal together creatively. So that is our eight secrets of how you can work with the market today. Okay. So we're open for questions. You got anything to add, Eric? Did I miss anything? Um, no, I think you got it all. I mean, yeah, the, the, just to end on that, yeah, the, the assumable mortgages are something more, we're seeing more. But you do, if you're assuming the mortgage in an FHA or VA situation, you still have to qualify. So it's not, you still have to go through the financing and qualifying. So it's not, uh, um, as, it's, not, it's not like a contract for deed as much or a subject to remain on have to qualify. You know, this makes, I remember a property I bought and that would have been in the late eighties. And I was able to assume a VA loan. I remember that now it was a duplex I bought. I think I, I had 2000 bucks in the game and I was able to assume. And actually the guy who had, I bought it from, he had assumed somebody else's VA loan. And then I like got to pull into Pull my car up and own it, pretty much. Hmm. So change that rule over the years. I don't know. Yeah, they must have because we thought that one deal was sweet, and then we found out we had to have a yeah, vet to buy it. VA, and so that kind of squashed that. <laughs> yeah. So okay, any questions? questions? Anybody? We're open. You got two sharp realtors here. You must have some question. I see some new people on there, so I appreciate it. Hello to all of you. Okay, Renee, you got to help us out. <laughs> She's oh, not scared can... to ask questions. Anybody? You got any questions, Eric? <laughs> no, I just say it's, it's, you know, the market is, you know, it is what it is at this point in time. You got to you got to learn to adjust. And so that's what those secrets are. There's different tips and ideas in there to give you ideas on what to do. Um, like I said, some of the trends that we're seeing is, is for investors is people are buying properties with really no cash flow um, or very little cash flow and assuming they can refinance down the road. We're seeing, like you said, people buying contract for deed, you know, the value add is a big, big one. Um, but the interesting thing is, is you think that the market's really soft with the days on market and all that. And I just went to a, a property the, over the weekend and it was an open house and I was there with my client and their investors looking at a townhouse and we walk in and it was, it was the open house started at 10 AM. It was 10 Oh five. And there was two people in there. We walked in, somebody walked in behind us. We walked, came out, somebody else was going in and they were already in multiple offers. So, you know, as, as the market goes, if, if it's priced right, it will still sell because there's still a lot of dem buyer demand out there, even with there the higher rates. So it's just, you know, when you're ready to make a jump on a property, you got to move. You can't, you can't wait. So if there's a good deal, you yeah. got to take advantage. You can't, if the, if it's time to go look, you can't wait till tomorrow because um, I wrote an offer on a condo. There was a condo came on the market. Um, they had nine offers. You know, we went day, day one, we were there. And they had nine offers. We were cash 
We were good. We were well over asking. We did not get it. So, I mean, it it's already started this spring market. Just know that we're seeing the multiple offers. There's also the one little opportunity is older inventory that nobody, you know, we, we never even had older inventory last year, but there is some out there and there are opportunities for some negotiation. If there's nobody else, you know, they're, they're kind of dried up. People forget to look at older inventory and there's nothing wrong with it. Sometimes maybe it was under contract and their financing fell apart. And then it just kind of gets lost in sort of a sea of unknown. I think it's an opportunity place to look. Okay, we got a few questions. Oh, there they are. I got to get over and see them. All right, here's what we got. How common are DSCR loans? That's debt service coverage ratio loans. They are way more common, Jeffrey. And um, different lenders handle them different ways. Just know that. So they should be shopped too. They're a much higher interest rate. Maybe you can get by with a lower down payment, but they're going to get you somehow. They are popular. You're seeing them out there now. Oh, the chat is disabled. No, I don't know why, but I'm glad you learned how to use the questions. Kitty is saying, I'd love to learn more about how to structure your purpose for tax benefits. What kind of professionals do you speak with? You know, I always recommend a uh, accountant, CPA, whatever, or tax person who has owned some real estate. That is like way, makes a huge difference. They understand it. And there's plenty of them out there, but that makes a difference. So look for someone who owns real estate. I also, on my YouTube channel, just last month, I interviewed Dave Aaron Krook, and he is a financial planner and tax guy all in one. Go back and listen on YouTube to last month's two months live ago. stream. And he'll- Two months ago. Oh, two months ago. Okay, yeah, yep. last month was Nate. Yep. So that might help you. Okay, Renee is saying- We've seen fewer opportunities in multifamily. We're assuming this is due to commercial rates. Have you seen similar? Um, yeah, although I actually have seen more in multifamily, but it scooped up fast. I've seen more in the duplex, fourplex, less in the eight to 20 units. But uh, it's scooped up fast. There is... The millennials caught on to real estate investing and buying and house hacking and living in one unit. And rent. I mean, there is way more buyers of that type of property than there was in many prior years. Like when we were buying your portfolio back eight, nine years ago, <laughs> it's a trend. And yes, the commercial rates are Let's see, we saw, uh, what was that, Erica? That Egan property or the... I don't remember what the rate uh, was. The, the, yeah. the one I was looking up yesterday, The was that a six unit? The one you showed to Ben. Yeah, that was a six unit. Six yeah. unit. And there was so many offers. I mean, I don't know. It was overpriced from what we could figure out. It was hard for a bank to get around the numbers, like you said, with the commercial rates. And this was less than seven then. And um, there was so many offers and yeah, it was gone. Like, you know, 30 something offers. Sometimes one of the ways to get around that is go a little further out. Because there's some, maybe you have to go up to Elk River or... You know, you got to swing a little further than right in. And the other, this is a great tip. You know, you got to tell people you're looking. You don't know if your neighbor or your friend or, you know, some of, sometimes places you frequent, your dentist, your whatever. Hair tell salon. People, you, hair salon, yeah. 
you don't know because they know a lot of people and they might, yeah, you know, my friend is, you know, has what he's tired of being a landlord. You can find a deal sometimes like that. Okay, what do we got? Philip is asking, are millennials still against buying homes? Are they renting single family homes? We saw an interesting uh, stat on that. It was about millennials and Gen Xers, you know. Um, Gen the, Z. Gen Z, sorry, yeah. Yep. Wrong, <laughs> wrong generation. <laughs> yeah, millennials, you know, they're about 30 years old now, aren't they, 30? Yeah, they're like 26 to 41 or something yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah, so, um, they probably want to live in the suburbs if they're married and not, you know, yeah. there's the crowd who wants to live in the warehouse district because they're the single run around town people. And then there's the families who want to live in the suburbs. Yeah, I would so, say that this trend has was a trend for a while where millennials were against buying homes and they wanted to rent. And that that's reversed over the last probably three, two, three years, three, four three years. years. And they've they've really started to switch into uh, buying more homes. I've I've sold quite a few to millennials over the last couple of years, where they're they're house hacking or they're just buying their first property or whatever. Um, so there is a shift now with the rates. It may have knocked some of them out of the market anyway. So that may go. They might go back to renting now because of it, or they have been. But um, prior to the rate increase, no, they were starting to buy homes. Yeah, they were, and they're. I mean, you know, just think about it. When we were millennials, we didn't have YouTube teaching us how to invest in real estate. We didn't have all the tools that they have. We didn't know how to game. Gaming has some components of business building. They That's have awesome. a different type of education. And so I love this. I'm in a mastermind with some, they're all really young, you know, anywhere from 18 to 30 years old, and they're making a lot of money. It's a digital marketing thing. But what I see is one thing. I may have business wisdom. What they have is they're not afraid. They will jump in and go full force and work hard and make it happen. And we get tempered with age. <laughs> so you'll, you're seeing millennials jump into the real estate market more than you ever imagined. Yeah. They're still going to rent though too with the families. Then they might not have time. You know, they're they're just good prospects. They all get pets are more popular though. People have pets. Older people have pets, and a lot of those millennials have pets. So if you have a no pet policy, you're you're saying no to some. That's yeah, what I've seen. A good good chunk of yeah, a good dangerous. chunk of, and they will pay. I mean, think about it. Fido is a hundred bucks a month. Yeah. That's, that, you know, as long as Fido doesn't damage your property. <laughs> right, exactly. That's why you need to have some rules in place. Um, any other questions? I know Kitty was just kind of clarifying her, her word at the top. So she's, that's not a question, but otherwise okay. I think that's it. Okay. Well, thank you everyone then for joining us and just know that uh, we'll be coming out with some new real estate investing related education. And if you need our help, both as the Encore team or some coaching, go ahead, look on my website. It's really easy. And well, this is the team. There. Oh yeah, there's the team. There you so go. You go to the EncoreInvestmentTeam.com and you can get information about any one of us. If you want to reach out to any of us about buying or selling property or investment property, feel free to do that. And then Leanne, here's your my free strategy session. Yeah. Go to the website. If you want the realty part, go to that realty group page. If you want coaching, there's a coaching page. So thank you very much for joining. Oh, yeah. One more thing, our Facebook community. I've got a nice, robust Facebook group where you can, I post articles that I see. I write a lot of things about the industry on my Real Estate Investing Made Simple Facebook group. And you just have to go leannereilly.com slash Facebook and it'll shoot you over there. Yeah, FB. Yep. All right. All right. Put so, us back on right. so we can wave goodbye. <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you next
month for our next live stream. Yep. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye, everyone.